for people around the world where they seek places for over. social distancing and safe living. But it's recording now, right? In the last couple of years, chances are you are all noticing that there are folks from different countries, different cultures, different backyard, backgrounds in your backyard. As a realtor, here is an incredible opportunity. If you always thought that being a global professional, a global real estate professional meant you had to board a plane, fly to another country to show property, that, is, that was never true. And even as an international realtor, you do not necessarily have to travel to another country to practice global real estate. A lot of my friends here, I see familiar faces, do travel internationally. It's a hard job and somebody has to do it. And guess what? If you do it, it's always a business expense. So embrace that life. And we travel through different time zones. My watches rarely show the right time, but it's the right time in some country somewhere in the world. <laughs> However, the National Association of Realtors and our underlying code of ethics commands that international is one of the real estate specialties where we are encouraged to secure and obtain the educational tools needed to transact in the space or consult with a global professional or disclose to your customers and clients that you do not have the tools and education necessary to work in the global space. As our world is shrink shrinking, our backyards have become global, and it is more important and imperative than ever that realtors rise to the challenge and learn how to be global. If you are a global realtor in this room, you will know that NAR has already identified global in my backyard as one of its themes for all its graphic graphics in the coming year. Some of you have already seen it. So what is not necessarily a secret to my fellow CIPS designees is what I hope to demystify a little to you. It is my hope to break down and explain the process of becoming a certified international property specialist. This is the only international designation that the National Association of Realtors confers and explain to you the benefits and tools and most importantly the massive global network that you two can share. Global professionals are the most sharing individuals I have met because it is a big world out there and there is room for everyone. If you are an international realtor, I welcome you. The format for today is meant to be interactive, which means we will learn together with input from many of my fellow CIPS designees and students in the room. We will all learn what it takes to be a global professional. I wrote down that red introduction because I knew I would forget my thoughts as I started speaking, uh, creating, talking through this presentation. So this is a picture of the backyard where I practice uh, my karate. It's not my backyard, it's my sensei's backyard. And my dojo is a melting pot of different cultures. We have Moroccans. We have Trinidad, we have Britain, we have India, we have uh, Cuba, quite a few other, uh, France, quite a few other countries. In my small dojo, in the small town where I live, I found this picture of our backyard picnic. This was one of our graduations, and this is how we, you know, got together. And I thought this would be the best picture of global in my backyard. So, what makes us think? that international real estate is happening. It is shown by the data, it is shown by the research. If you are not aware, the National Association of Realtors publishes its data in the international transaction in US residential real estate. This is a research study that is done every year. And I think it has been published since what year? In 2009? Yeah, probably. Probably. So. Yeah. So, so yes, 2009. The data, what it does, it, it first defines what the National Association of Realtors defines as an international buyer. It breaks it down. 
We don't see international or NAR does not see international in the way that you may see it uh, or even the Census Bureau may see it. NAR has a specific uh, definition of an international buyer. The, the data, this research paper also defines countries of origin of international buyers. It also defines where these buyers are buying in. It defines where they're coming from and then defines where they're buying in. So if you see a trend and if you can correlate it to what is happening in your backyard, you're already in the process of discovery about what is going on everywhere in backyards across the United States of America. So how many of you have noticed this trend, have noticed people from other cultures, other countries buying in your backyard? Yes, ma'am. Introduce I'm, yourself. <laughs> My name is Bonnie Sierra, um, what, Palm Beach County, Florida. Um, I'm Colombian. So I'm seeing that a lot of my Colombian family and influx of their friends are coming to Florida, Palm Beach County. Anybody else in the room would like to share some insight about what they are seeing in their backyard in terms of international real estate activity? Yes, ma'am. I'm Priya Reshmuk. I'm also from Palm Beach, and I am seeing so it's, I don't know if it's international, it's some of that as well, and I think more to follow, but definitely I'm seeing more Indians coming to our area because now they can work from anywhere, and typically they were in New York, California, and places where you know they could work from, and now that they can do that from Florida and still keep their jobs, we're definitely seeing a lot of that increase from within the U.S., which then brings more of their relatives to invest where they're living. So, so you touched upon something very important. So India, um, if y'all cannot tell, I'm from India. I was born and raised in India. So Indians love tropical climates. I live in Florida because I like warm. I don't do cold. So with the work at home and what where where you can work from anywhere, a lot of Indians are choosing Florida to work in because it's just as hot and miserable as it is in India. <laughs> so when I go to India to ask companies to open up operations in the United States, I tell them, you know what? It'll feel just like at home. It'll be, it'll be just as hot and just as miserable as India. A little bit less. India goes a little bit more. Where is Sam? I saw Sam. He, uh, he left for a minute, I guess. So um, Sam Arora is the president of the National Association of Realtors India, and he is here. So I was going to have him tell you that how, how, how much hotter it is in India. Um, <laughs> as, as hot and tropical as Florida is, India is even more. So what you have touched upon, Priya, is something we all need to pay attention to. If Indians are buying in the state of Florida, then that is something we must pay, pay attention to because what do we need to do to understand or work with Indians, not for you, but for anybody who is not from India? And can you help me out here? You know, I live in a town in, in Irving, Texas. Okay. They call it the headquarters of headquarters. Can you introduce yourself? Oh, so my name is Ed Aiken with the Aiken Group in Dallas, Texas. And like I said, I live in a, uh, a city uh, that's called Irving, Texas, and it's the headquarters of headquarters, which means that we have a lot of huge companies um, from all over the world uh, right next or in the city that I live in, which is five minutes from one of the busiest airports in the world. And I can tell you, not only do we have a lot of people coming from Mexico uh, to Texas, obviously, but right there in Irving, Texas, it's a huge Indian population. And why? It's because all the big corporations there, and they all come here and, and uh, work, you know, for these corporations. And I have, I'm blessed to work with a lot of these people, and what I have found out is whoever comes over, their brothers and sisters end up coming over. Their parents come over, their grand, or their grandkids come over. So man, once you help, you know, somebody in a family like that, man, they keep calling you and keep coming back, so. So Ed, 
would you be safe to say that if you are working with Indians and you are not from India, you've had to make some adaptations. You've had to make some learning happen about our culture. Absolutely, all cultures are different. Yes. And, uh, and they all work in different ways and have different expectations of the process. So what I have found out, explaining the process, you know, thoroughly of how it works, because when you're coming from another country into the States, they are not used to the way we do business and not used to the way the market works in a particular area. They, they've never seen it, they've never heard it, and somebody needs to explain it to them so, you know, it goes smoothly. So um, the reason I'm having everybody introduce themselves is because this is a networking session. And I'm hoping y'all will network beyond the scope of this session and find resources in each other. Ed Eakin is a CIPS professional and one of the most <coughs> helpful persons you will ever encounter. He's very helpful to anyone who needs help. He is one of our mentors in the CIPS mentoring program. So we define an international buyer. So there are two types of international buyers. That is defined by the National Association of Realtors. Type A is non-resident foreigners, and type B is resident foreigners, who are non-US citizens with permanent residences, US citizens who are recent immigrants less than two years at the time of the transaction, or non-immigrant visa holders who reside for more than six months in the US for professional education or other reasons. These are the two definitions of an international buyer. This definition is written in that research activity which is available for download in your um, <coughs> realtor profile at, at the National Association of Realtors. So, I think Ed touched upon it a little bit before, and we're gonna talk a little bit about what are the elements of an international transaction. So instead of me telling you, I'm gonna put a friend of mine on the spot, Rory, can you, you know it, you, uh, you were expecting it because I, uh, can you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about why, what Ed said already, a foreigner will require a lot more general education on the process the transaction will follow. Why do you, what, what, what makes it, how is it different in other countries and what makes that important? So my name is Rory Dubin, I'm with, from uh, Jacksonville, Florida, a member of Northeast Florida Association of Realtors. And there, there's a lot of different cultures, like Ed mentioned, it's not, it's different parts of the world, there's continental differences, but then there's individual country differences. Um, one resource that I learned early, early on, I've, had, I've been on CIPS for about 15 years, um, was Morrissey's book, Terry Morrissey's book, Kiss, Bow, or Shake Hands. She's had like eight different versions of it now. But if you're new to global real estate or want to find out more about it, I, that's probably one of the best resources, is that Kiss, Bow, or Shake Hands. But what's acceptable in one culture would be seen as being rude or, or not very nice in another culture. And it's everything from the way you point your feet or your hands in some countries, the way you hand your business card to people. These are all nuances that you need to become aware of if you're gonna do uh, real estate either abroad or foreigners coming to our area. Thank you. And that's what segues into the next point on the presentation, that licensees may need to spend more time building trust and credibility before business can be done. Who do you do business with? As a rule, who do you do business with? Can anybody answer that question? People that you like and trust. Exactly, trust is an important factor. So how do you build bridges of trust with people from another culture? who are not familiar, who have not been in this country have been, or, or not have been uh, habituated with the way we do business. We transact real estate differently from many other countries. What we consider every day, what we consider norm and what we consider our process 
is not the norm everywhere. And then there are cultural differences. So there is a lot of time that needs to be spent on the front end educating your buyers and sellers about how we transact business. And so that the time is needed to spend to build trust. And it is a two-way process. It is a give and take. Your seller is going to trust you or your buyer is going to trust you with their transaction, with the most important financial decision that they are making in their lifetime for many of them. And so to earn that trust, you have to demonstrate to them that you are capable of understanding different cultures. If you understand, and assimilate different cultures, it does not change you. It does not make you different or become somebody else. You still remain yourself, but you learn some incredible tools, and of course you get some, in, you learn some incredible cuisine in the process at times. Timing of transactions. Timing of transactions may be outside the control of customers as they await immigration approval, for instance. Have any of you, and I'm asking this for all of you, whether you are a real estate professional, I see my friends in, uh, who work in international title, Monica at the back, uh, can you touch upon uh, the possibility of why timing and transactions may be outside the control of the customer? What, what can happen uh, for immigration approval? Have you encountered it, and how does it affect the transaction? immigration status already here. Has anybody in this room been affected by immigration uh, as, a, as you know, a process creating delays uh, in, in buying? It depends on the country that they're buying from. So one of the things that the United States is great as, we don't mind, we don't care not, not care is probably not a, not a good choice of words. We will take everybody's money, but then you have to figure out whether you can come into the country or not. You can buy, but you may not be able to occupy the home you buy. So if somebody is coming here to uh, live in the house, that's when you need an immigration attorney. That's where you need to consult the immigration attorney. And one of the things that you must have on your team is an immigration attorney if you are working with international buyers and sellers. Banking regulations and foreign currency movements both have a significant impact on an international transaction. Foreign currencies, as we all know, fluctuate. We learned yesterday at the Real Estate Business Institute meetings and other meetings in global um, that in some countries, uh, currencies fluctuate from day to day. So their buying power is changed dramatically. So with the example of maybe simple math, when the currency maybe weakens to the dollar and your currency is not transferred to the United States on time, then by the time you are at closing, you may be actually spending more of the country's currency to buy the same property here in the United States. That can happen with just simple passage of time. Unless you educate your customer earlier in the process that, hey, we can see or connect them. You know, as realtors, we are always sources of the source. Connect them with somebody who is a foreign exchange expert. And they can tell the, your customer that, hey, the trend is it's going down. So it's a wise idea now to transfer the money in the United States now before closing so that you do not put your money at risk of being needing more at closing or needing more just to come to the contract price at closing. There are generally no restrictions on stipulations on international customers acquiring property in the United States, but specific restrictions, reporting requirements may apply for instance, for individuals from hostile countries may be restricted. There are requirements for reporting of agricultural land purchases. So all of these 
are things that you learn as your transaction tools as you become a global professional. Then there are foreign <coughs> investors must, must abide by specific reporting and compliance requirements. How many of you have ever heard about FERCTA? Mm -hmm. So FERCTA is absolutely, you know, it's something most of us have uh, encountered. Um, at, at, it's the foreign uh, reporting tax, a foreign investment Real property tax. Real property tax uh, act. <laughs> I went blank for a second. Okay, more elements of an international transaction. You cannot work uh, by yourself. You need a team, and uh, you need a team which understands an international transaction. So you establish your international team, and then you identify and understand cultural considerations. Here is the thing that no one can become an expert of the world. As I teach the CIPS Institute, a CIPS Institute spends five days or six days, as uh, you know, depending on the association. We have six um, modules right now. Everyone, we basically sit in a classroom and tour the world. But none of us can become a specialist of the world. We identify the country that we want to work with, and then we take a deeper dive into the cultures and the cultural considerations of that country. And then you build and con consolidate your international network, and your international network may not always be in another country. Your ne international network, too, may be partially in this country because you may have an international partner in another city where you may be doing business with. And that is where it is different now. Because years and years ago, when, you know, Rory, perhaps when you got your uh, CIPS designation, it was a lot more international, which, are, which is directly international. But now, more and more, Priya, you could be sending a client to uh, Ed, or, you know, Rory, you could be sending a client to Ed, or uh, vice versa, which means that International is happening in everybody's backyard. Your realtor connections wrap, wrap the globe. They are your, your real estate connections will wrap the globe because if, as, as Ed said, when one person in the family comes, somebody else in the family moves, uh, comes to the United States, they buy from you. Because what have you built with that first transaction? Trust. Trust. You've taken that time, you've invested the time to build the trust. So where do you think they will go to buy again? Who will they recommend to their cousins, to their friends, who absolutely have no idea? If you have not lived as an immigrant coming to this country, you have no idea, or any country, going, going to live in another country, you have no idea the sheer breadth of lack of knowledge. When you're going to visit, it's different from where you're, when you're going to live. So there's a lot of trust that is needed in the process. There's a lot of unknowns. So if you are the one bridge of trust, if you are the one person that they can trust, and they can find the local connections that they need, then you will continue to be the trusted advisor that they will bring in. So from that one local connection, you have created global connections. The National Association of Realtors has international realtor partners in more than 100 countries, and we are adding every day. A couple of uh, MOUs were signed here. Are, this, are, are we not signing a couple of MOUs at this uh, conference also? So that happens every day. So to get the CIPS designation, there are several elements of it. The business beyond real estate, and uh, we understood already that the Article 11 in the NAR Code of Ethics is why CIPS education is important. And then you travel the world in the classroom, as I said, and you gain some highly specialized skills. 
and you gain the network of international realtors and you gain educational tools for which uh, may affect real estate uh, specialties. So, I'm going to talk a little bit about how to get your CIPS designation. How many in this room have your CIPS? You don't have your CIPS designation? So, uh, if, you, if you do not, then this is a designation because a lot of times I get asked the question about, um, you know, because a lot of realtors feel intimidated by the process and they want to know how to get the CIPS designation and there's a lot of perception that it is a difficult designation to get. There's a little, little bit of work to it. The learning itself is a little bit of a marathon, but it is not very difficult. You are, you are required to take two core courses. One of them is local markets, which is usually day one or one day. Uh, the next one is transaction tools. And if you're a, for an international realtor, your course would be the business of US real estate. Your electives are three from these four modules. So we just added Africa and international real estate to the four modules that we had before. And so these are, so you pick three of these electives. If you want to learn four, you're welcome to attend the fourth module somewhere because learning is never wasted and um, you will always gain from the learning. One elective may be substituted for NERs at home with diversity or resort and second home property specialist or the pricing strategies <coughs> mastering the CMA. These are the only courses that may be substituted for one elective. And once you finish your education, the next part is you complete the application form. You have to compute a total of 100 points to gain the designation from 11 categories. And the categories differ, and there are, there are different ways that you can earn the 100 points over the, on the application. So if you have an advanced degree, if you know another country, if you've been to another country, if you've studied at another country, if you have, if you're part of a global council in your local area, if you're part of more than one global council, there are different ways. If you have published a, an article in the newspaper about an international uh, real estate, there are many ways to earn those 100 points and they are easier than you think. And then, <coughs> NAR reviews the applications and emails the decision. So as I explain this process to you, my question is to the to my realtor friends in this room who do not have the CIPS designation. Can you perhaps um, identify if if you think you have done a global transaction? and you probably did not know it, you did not understand it, or you didn't think it was global because you thought global was only, ha only happened in another country. Yes, ma'am? I have. You have? So where did you think your, your um, transaction happened? What? Um, their culture, they were Haitian. Okay. So I had to get to know the grandmother and trust in her because she was guiding them to buy the house and their um, cultural mannerisms I had to understand. And so the, the daughter was explaining to me like when you speak to my mom or when you address her, or how this is her opinion's important because of this reason. So I had to play that field of and now that you say that, I, I didn't think of it like that. I was like, okay, I'm feel, dealing with family dynamics. I'm problem solving here. So you were dealing with a very important cultural aspect from Haiti, which means that the, 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 the seniors in the family mm -hmm. play an important role in the decision making. Mm -hmm. So what other countries, I'm gonna challenge some more of my uh, you know, uh, CIPS friends to, what other countries 
are there where um, the parents or uh, the uh, older family members, retired family members play an important role in the, in the decision making? <coughs> Kishan. Please, can you can you stand up and introduce yourself? Kishan Advani is all the way from Guam. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm a fellow of CITS. I, uh, um, so I, you know, just similar to your example, I actually you know have have dealt with a lot of clients uh, from Taiwan, China, Korea, and uh, you know, deal either with the mom, the dad. You're you're still it's still a global transaction when you deal with that. So I. The importance is placed on your uh, your uh, on, on seniors. They have earned the right to uh, help in the decision making. So if you think that the person who is going to sign the check is the only important person in the room and you ignore the other person, you've just lost your transaction right there. Mm -hmm. <coughs> that can happen very quickly. As a young student, not very young, I was a lot younger than I was. As a graduate student in this country, I walked into the office of an insurance agent. And the man had his boots. He wore, I remember, uh, boots with spurs on them. <laughs> and he had his boots on his table, on some paperwork. I can see from Priya's expression that it horrifies her and it horrified me. The man is, we, we worship books because books are the goddess Saraswati. It is the goddess of education. Anybody who has even read a single letter in their lives will never put their feet on books. And that man lost my business through no fault of his really. I learned later, he, I mean, he wasn't trying to offend me. He was just relaxing in his office. And guess what he did? He lost my business, which wasn't much. I'm a, I was a graduate student, what do graduate students make anyway? Uh, but he lost my business regardless. So understanding cultural considerations are very important. When I went to India in 2016, um, I was, uh, requested by the city of Gainesville to talk to the Chamber of Commerce, to talk to various industry houses, to ask if they would consider opening operations in, in Gainesville. And um, when I went to Bombay, I was, uh, you know, my appointment was with one of the uh, patriarchs of the family. And I, was, I felt very honored because he was no longer active in the industry, but what I shared with him, he would share with his family when they had dinner together. And he would tell his friend, uh, uh, son, that, son, this is what happened. This lady came to uh, us, and maybe we should think about this part of the country, of the world, to open up business. Mm -hmm. This is the culture. Anybody else in this room, would you like to share something else that you learned from a different culture uh, and from encountering a different culture, how they do business. Yes, sir. So in uh, 2020, I had a client from Turkey. She was a top engineer. And she was looking to move to just south of me, St. Augustine, for a educational visa where she was going to be training engineers locally near Marineland in, in that area. And she was coming over with her daughter. Her husband was a prominent doctor in, mm -hmm. in Turkey, so he was he was staying behind. And she was planning on coming for on that visa for about two years. Um, very very concerned actually about COVID. She heard back in Turkey that Florida had a lot of COVID at the time. Um, but we did we we figured out the time difference, which was almost exactly 12 hours, and did Zoom calls. Um, so the Zoom training we all had in our other meetings has helped with the international meetings. We had a number of Zoom calls, and her English was very good, so that was important. My Arabic's not that good. <laughs> At least you have it, actually. <laughs> so, we had, so she was very, uh, very, very, and was considered a top engineer, actually, in, in Turkey. So um, 
She had some cultural considerations for her daughter. Her daughter was very gifted in music. She wanted to find good schools in the area. Very concerned, just like any of our customers might be with uh, the good school districts in that area where she should move so that her daughter was in a good school district. Um, safety, of course, you know, she wanted to make sure that she said it's gonna, it was gonna be her and her daughter that was safe. So it's interesting the similarities you'd have with any customer, but also the specific cultural um, considerations she had coming from Turkey. So the relational aspect of culture uh, where the, there are cultures where the relationships are very important are on the one end of the continuum, the cultural continuum that you will read about when you go through your CIPS Institute. One end is the high context cultures, like the Asian cultures, for instance. And on the other end is which culture? The United States of America which I hesitate to say because the USA is very adaptable to doing business. And this is my faith in all of you as realtors because we are resilient, we learn. But I only speak about the traditional you know, type of the other end of the cultural continuum. Germans are also deemed as people who are in the other end of the continu uh, cultural continuum. These are people from low context cultures. How would you think you would work with somebody in the United States or from Germany from some of the low context cultures? I would ask Brian. Brian Woods is one of the he's one of my one of my mentors. He's one of the best this country has. He is a past CIPS Instructor of the Year and my very dear friend. Thank you. <laughs> um, you know, a direct, uh, you gotta be direct in your uh, communication here. Certainly you need to explain to people that, hey, when you actually sign your name to a piece of paper here, that it's not like we're going back and renegotiating, it's all up in the air uh, later on because there's a lot of clusters where that is the case. Um, you've got, you've got punctuality here, um, whereas in a lot of the high context cultures, uh, time is a little bit more uh, fluid. So I'll just say that uh, an example of high context cultures may be more of your islands. Uh, and many of you probably have heard of <laughs> island time, I can promise yep. you. Indian uh, standard time. Indian standard time <laughs> and, uh, and, and Caribbean and all of that. So, um, you know, so there's a, a few different uh, ideas there. Uh, Rory mentioned uh, Kiss Bauer Shake Hands earlier, which is an awesome book that I think you all should have. But also another one that I think uh, you should put on your reading list is The Culture Map by Aaron Meyer. And Aaron Meyer was actually a uh, speaker at NAR in 2017 in uh, Chicago. But you can learn a lot. Uh, again, just like Kiss Power Shake Hands, the book has nothing to do with real estate. It has everything to do with culture itself. So, so something that Brian touched upon, time. The perception of time is different from and people from high context cultures and low context cultures. Have you ever invited somebody from the Caribbean or South America? And I'm not, again, some of my South American friends may be uh, not true to this type, but depending, have they been late to an event? <laughs> do they do it to hurt your feelings? No. Do they do it to insult you, offend you, any of these things? No. 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 Yes, ma'am. So, Ms. Trisha, from <coughs> my name is Anna Smith, and I am from uh, Pinellas County here in Florida. I've had my CIPS for several years, and I can attest to that being a Hispanic because I'm originally from Colombia. And there's an ongoing joke with us in Colombia. If you set your party at 12, you better send an invitation around 10.30. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's one of those things that no, they don't do it on purpose. It's just, it just, 
somebody over there understand that you better be on time or be 15 minutes early as Polly said yes. if you're not 15 minutes early you're late you're late if you're not 15 minutes early you're, you're late. late there you go and so therefore there's a whole uh, I, it would be interesting to see the uh, dinner where you, uh, you know, somebody from the Midwest invite somebody from the island <laughs> <laughs> everybody's gone to bed <laughs> hey, right. Outside of this discussion, because I mean, we could all laugh, we could all 
you know, been a part of it. But one other thing that I find that a lot of times people forget about time is this thing called time zones. And if you say 9 a.m., 9 a.m. where? Yeah. I mean, we joke about it when we go to the, you know, get an adult beverage or whatever, right? It's 5 o'clock somewhere. Right? But think about that. When you're setting your meetings, when you're doing different things, uh, I've had meetings where I've been on with like Dubai and somebody over in Central Europe and somebody in Eastern uh, time zone in the US and Central and, and Pacific all on the same meeting. Yeah. Somebody got to be up in the middle of the night on that, yeah. right? Yeah. So, you know, and what time is it? You know, 9 a.m. I, you know, I think as a global practitioner, it's always important to put in time zone along with whatever it is that you're doing. So you are perfectly clear. Even here in Florida, we have two different time zones. Yeah. <laughs> and that is so important when you are setting times. When I first came to the United States, my brother would call me in the middle of the night. What time is it? It's 2 a.m. Oh, you're up. Can we talk? No, I'm sleeping. <laughs> It's daytime over there. You had something to say. Yes, and then to tag along with what his comment is and what is on the screen, uh, when I did my CIPS application, uh, one of the, uh, the international transactions that I did was with a gentleman from Qatar. Well, they're 11 hours ahead of us, or nine hours, whatever the case might be. But okay. one of us had to take turns, and we, and we did it amazingly. We, we set up our boundary, and then we put ourselves into, and back then there was no Zoom, there was no Skype, there was, it was just, it was, it was horrible. Anyway, <laughs> uh, but we kind of like took turns. So he will say to me, he says, don't worry Anna, I'll stay up tomorrow. And then I'll be like, okay, so I will stay up. The next day I'll stay up. So we spoke either super early for me or super late for him. But we did put those expectations ahead of time to find out who was going to be up and who was going to be down and where the uh, middle ground would be. Because he was a military, so he couldn't speak in the middle of the day. He was a, um, a general in, in Qatar, and then he's, he was moving back to the United States. That's why I helped him out. So it wasn't any middle ground during the day that we both have a little bit of sunlight. So. So doing those kind of things, understanding your client, understanding where they're coming from, understanding the time part of it, the culture part of it, is what is gonna set you apart from the rest of your, of your peers. Thank you, thank you. That is uh, very, very important. Which brings us uh, to the next part. Uh, one of the things, when you get your CIPS designation, these are the things that are part of your benefits. You get an online directory profile. People can search via name and probably find you based on which countries you decide to specialize in. We have over 4,800 CIPS designees in 61 countries. This number changes based on renewals or like this year we've had more than 650 new designees. You get access to a dedicated CIPS Facebook designee group and you get networking opportunities at realtor meetings like this one here. You get access to the Global Marketing Center, which has customizable postcards, PowerPoint slides for consumer listing and buyer presentations. You get customizable press releases, which you are supposed to send out when you get your designation, and the use of the CIPS logo. You also get uh, the Global Perspectives, which is a newsletter that's been mailed to you bi-monthly. You are not really, even if you're not a news reading person, then you get uh, access to global news all the time. You get a custom referral form because just like over here in the United States, referrals have to be written down in, in writing when, you are, when you're doing it business internationally and you get the newsletter. In addition to this, you will make the best friendships and connections that span the globe. You will 
become friends with some of the most amazing professionals in the world. I know in this room, I see uh, Kishan from Guam, I see Tahir from Canada. Uh, Tahir, can you really, uh, introduce yourself? Canada just happens to be, you know, one of our, obviously our neighbor and one of the resources for our biggest transactions and Canada is passing some regulation, are they, to, uh, uh, that is going to affect how many Americans get to buy property in Canada? Oh, that was a federal government regulation uh, that restricted uh, buying single detached home for the next two years, starting from January 1st, up to six units. So because we have about 50,000 uh, shortage of housing uh, before pandemic hit us, there's a 400,000 million coming in 2022, it must be buying. Before we have a uh, Highest sales transaction in 2021 and during the pandemic. And uh, we are right now about 60% of the lot what we did last year because uh, off the rule, which is a stress test uh, from the federal government and also the Bank, uh, Bank of Canada raised uh, because inflation was 8% uh, early this year, after March. So now it's gone to a little bit seven, uh, it's getting close to 7.1, but uh, <coughs> interest rate. Uh, has gone up to uh, uh, 4% from this morning. My son is in uh, Missouri Medical School, and I borrowed 150,000 to give him for first year, and I was paying 300. Now I'm paying 1,500 for the same money that I borrowed wow. early in January for him. Wow. So you can imagine that, that how it's gonna escalate. Lots of people bought properties because they, they wanna get into the house, and they took very able use every means of collecting money to get into the house, but now affordability is an issue. Yeah. So cost of, especially the variable, not fixed one, uh, is unaffordable for people. So uh, people don't qualify. I have a, uh, she knows that I have a global. Tahir is a part of our uh, you know, CIPS network. He has great uh, global networks. He is somebody to connect with. So we appreciate so you being you here. I'm going to invite all of you. If you are at CIPS, I created a global real estate professional network on Facebook. It's a private group for CIPS only. And I have a monthly conference called Global Connectivity Conference on Real Estate. I was using CIPS, but they told me CIPS is individual, so I changed it to Global Real Estate Professional Network. So we have a 20 consecutive month conferences. They're all recorded there on YouTube. And if you are a CIPS, look for Global Real Estate Professional Network, and I implore you to join it. And we share market updates around the world. And 80%, I would say 75 to 80% from the United States. So you can come and join, and you can present the market update, you know, one pager, what's going on in the market, because, you know, the, the, the CIPS is a really a powerful tool for connecting. And yes, that is that is absolutely true. Thank you. It's a power of so, ideas. and so I hope that you join. Thank you, Tahir. Thank you. So, how to obtain your CIPS designation? So, your NAR Global Resources has a list of CIPS institutes that is held around the country, and then if you don't see one that you can attend, you can ask your association to host a CIPS institute. We have about 70 instructors worldwide that teach the CIPS designation. And you can ask your local realtors whether they are seeing international buyers in their area. And that will give them give an idea about you know, whether there is viability of holding a CIPS institute in your area. There are other global resources in your own community. Attend international cultural groups, become part of international cultural groups. If you look around in every community, there are international cultural groups. And chances are many of you have seen the evidence of these cultural groups. Yes, ma'am. Could you give me an example of an international cultural group? Filipino group, the Indian group, just every every community has cultural groups. So you might consider attending a holy event or uh, you know, uh, a, a, a Diwali event or something like that, which will help you get to know, uh, I'll, I'll come to you in a second. And then there is Chambers of Commerce, 
state chambers <coughs> of commerce events, and many more, which are uh, possible. Yes, ma'am, go ahead. And to help Ryan answer the question, there is actually groups, like the old clubs, I'm sorry. Uh, for example, in Canada, the area, there is the German club, there is the French club, or the society. So if Google, like the German society club, or the, the French society, whatever, whatever, but just put it in there, and then they will pop up everywhere. The, the Facebook, the CIPS designee group, that is the only official CIPS designee group uh, that is uh, by the National Association of Realtors. It's very active. So uh, one of my friends asked me, if I get the designation, is it going to make money? No. The designation is not a money tree in your backyard. It only makes money if you make it work. If you put it to, the, to work, if you make the international connections, if you transact business internationally, if you build relationships, and all of you at your fingertips have many connections here in this room. Many of you are from other parts of the world, other parts of the country. So this is where your international business can be, become. If you're curious about it, then ask your association to host a CIPS Institute. My contact information is on the screen. If you all have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. I have put some business cards on some of the tables. Feel free to grab one if you have any questions. And thank you, thank you so much for to all of you for attending. I hope I have been able to arouse your curiosity about the CIPS designation if you do not already have it. Thank you.